What's up guys, today I'm working on the 2013 G55 wagon, and as you can tell, it's black. This is a beautiful 5.5 liter V8, putting out about 382 horsepower. Now the interesting thing about the G wagon is it hasn't really changed its appearance in 23 years, the exterior appearance, because it has uh, an iconic image, if you will, and I think it looks pretty good. Now the reason why I've been called out here today is for one of my biggest pet peeves. One of my, it's even more than that, it's something that just crosses a line and makes me furious and that is it's about a nine foot key scratch all the way down the side of the car now i definitely know uh why or how this happened i guess you should say is it wasn't like we were going through the back or the owner of the car wasn't going through some big mountains and trees and the whole nine yards and a tree caught it that would be uh, annoying but acceptable this was parked in a parking lot for you know lunch or dinner or what have you and somebody came out and clearly keyed it and i can actually see some marks and we'll pull the camera in there's something about that that just uh, doesn't sit with me right, as I'm sure you can imagine, and it just really uh, irritates me. So as a car guy, I'm sure all of uh, this sort of feeling can resonate. So today we're going to talk about how to repair this and some of the thought process that goes into it. Now, in this particular case, we're going to talk about a few different things, and one of them is this would normally need to be repainted uh, the entire panel. And the problem is it's multiple panels, which is more complicated. And there's these middle sections here they have to take out. It's a complicated repaint and extremely expensive. So we're going to take a shot at uh, trying to repair it today. That's all coming up today on this episode of Ride Along. As you can see, we pulled the car inside. Now, before I did that, I actually did a few things uh, to make my life easier when I'm done with the process. First thing was, I cleaned the wheels, I washed the car. Now, on the, the scratch itself, uh, as I was washing it and soaping it down, I actually did a little bit of clang, and the reason why I did that is a little bit of forethought. I was thinking ahead of time, knowing that I'm gonna have to polish this with a three-inch Roops polisher, and when I do that, I didn't want to have any issues uh, in terms of contamination sticking up and having my pad go in there. It's just it's smart, it took 30 seconds to do, and I wanted to wash everything down because when I present the car back to the owner, I don't want to have to redo everything and touch everything. I kind of want to just uh, keep this area sensitive. So I'll vacuum and whatnot, but I figured, hey, why don't we do the wash beforehand? So that's something you might want to keep, uh, keep in mind. Okay, after that, dried it down. I want to make sure that I use the air compressor because you really don't want any air, uh, you don't want any water, excuse me, flowing all over the things that you're doing, especially in the crack. And this particular car, much like a Hummer, uh, one of the H1 Hummers or even an H2 Hummer, there's all these little intricacies that uh, water gets trapped in, so make sure you use compressed air. After it was completely dry, I, uh, I started setting up my, my drop cloth here. And the reason why I did that is there's rubber on the actual car. These, if, you, if you know the G550, um, there's these, these little rubber parts. I'll, I'll take an up-close picture of it. And they react weird to you know, waxes and things of that nature. It's just like molding, but it's in, kind of in a funky area. It's right in the middle of the door. So sort of my plus minus, what I like to do is think, hey, how long is it gonna take me to cover this and how much does it cost? It cost me $4 and took me 10 minutes. Based on the price of the car, 120, 130,000, whatever, you know, around that price, uh, sometimes you gotta use your head and say, for 10 minutes, I'm just gonna avoid any problems. I don't want anything dripping down here. I just, it's gonna make my life easier. So this is what I did. Is it overkill? Maybe a little bit, but I think that's why a customer like this might uh, want someone like me working on the car, because I'll have a little bit more uh, protection here. So spend 10 minutes, be smart about it. After that, uh, the next step, that you want to do is you want to do 91% isopropanol to clean it out. Now I, I envision this like this. With a scratch in this nature or this you know kind of depth, it's almost like getting a cut on your skin. The first thing you want to do is clean it out. And a lot of times, uh, not necessarily with alcohol, but uh, you know, you want to put some uh, you know, things that will clean the cutout when you go to the emergency room, let's say. In this case, you're going to take all the oils and all the gunk and everything uh, out of it so that all of our new things can stick to it, like Bondo. So we're going to talk more about some of the steps that I did. But I worked on the back uh, just because I wanted to see how it, would, you know, how it was working out. And we'll go over some of the intricacies and the tips. Uh, but it's, it's going pretty good. This is a two-day process. And uh, I'll bring the camera in and show you how I'm going to do this middle panel with a bit of Bondo. 
Now the techniques I'm showing you today, I actually learned from a dear friend of mine, Richard Lynn. He is the master at touching cars up and he, he just does it so it looks absolutely perfect. So I've been on the phone with him back and forth and he's been helping me out because I'm just always like really interested in hearing how other people uh, think about things, perceive things and how they actually do it. So a uh, big shout out to him. Thanks for doing that. Um, but one of the things that we talked about is we were debating whether uh, to, to wet sand first. And right off the bat, can you hear that? It's pretty deep. So any chance of wet sanding it out is not really an option. But the second thing is when a key mark like this or a scratch or whatever the, the item was that uh, impacted the paint, if it's uh, kind of a, a jagged edge, what's going to happen is there's going to be a scratch, right? This is going to be the V of the scratch. But on top of it, there's going to be all these little spikes that sometimes can happen. And you can feel that by running your hand across it with a glove on or without. You'll be able to feel like this. A little, like your glove will be catching a little bit and you can almost hear it. In this case, it's, it, we don't have that. So in the beginning, I was thinking, hmm, before I arrived here, maybe I'll have to wet sand it with 2000 just to kind of clean out the edges. And if you remember from the video I did uh, where there was a, a symbol on the, on the hood, I actually had to do that because the edges were really rough. And the way that I found that out was one, you can feel it, but the two, because I'm uh, you know, a nerd and insane, I put a microscope on there because I could see, the, I you know, got really close and I could see the edges and there wasn't anything sticking up. So what's the point of the story? Normally, I guess I wouldn't say normally, but on some occasions I will have to wet sand this down just to make a flat surface, just um, so the, the paintbrush and the Bondo and all the things that we're doing, the polishing doesn't catch in the things sticking up, the paint sticking up or the key mark or whatever it is sticking up. So we skip that step. Now, what I, what I did after that, uh, knowing that I don't have to do that is, is the isopropanol. Clean it all out and now it's ready, dry and clean for Bondo. On Richard's suggestion, and I left these out here, these are old, is I taped around the scratch and I taped very, very, very close. In fact, I took a little microscope shot of it and I'll show you how close the tape was to the actual scratch. And the reason why I did that was I didn't want any uh, overflow either by sanding, which we didn't do, but if I were to sand it, it'd make it so there wasn't any uh, space, uh, extra or, or overlap, if you will. And then the other part was I had to put Bondo in there. We're gonna do the Bondo trick and I'll speak more about that on this side. I just wanna show you you know, stage one, it looks much better, but if you get up close, you can see there's a bunch of bumps and ridges, which is okay because I'm letting it dry. We're gonna sand it later. But the reason that makes it so difficult and kind of a challenge and why this, this, is, a, this is a really hard one to do for multiple reasons because it's so deep, because the car is really expensive, and because of this plastic, I have no room to get in here. So I really needed to tape up the entire thing and see if I could test it. Now, there, for, for the record here, there's, there, there's no right way to do this. Um, there's only multiple options and you have to pick and choose. And right now, with you know, the sort of Rolodex of all the things that I've done, and I have Richard Lynn on my shoulder helping me, I'm trying to pick and choose uh, what's gonna fit best. So I may not use the tape technique, so I'm gonna show you with no tape over here, the Bondo trick, and we're gonna just um, kind of get it in the, get in the hole to fill in that hole. So now it's gonna fill it up. And then on top of that later on, like I did here, I'm gonna put touch up paint. That's gonna be a crown on top of it. And then tomorrow, once this all dries, I'm gonna come back, sand it and polish it and do, do those steps. So that's, that's the two day process. And the day that you're waiting is all based on uh, drying the paint. Now, ideally you'd like to have a heat lamp on there. I didn't have it here because I, I actually traveled very far to get here and it's kind of hard to put uh, one of those uh, in a car. And so I didn't do that. It's, you have to kind of you use the tools that you have. So I jacked up the heat in here so it's nice and warm. I have a big lamp here. It's about 85 degrees in here. It'll sit overnight. I'll put a light even closer. So we should be okay um, in terms of the cure time. So let's uh, do the Bondo trick and show you um, what Bondo is all about. All right, the trick that I learned from Richard is to actually use a bit of Bondo. Now this is Bondo Glazing and Spot Putty uh, by 3M. Now you're gonna open it up. Now what I'm using here is just a plastic squeegee. So I can bend, super safe, not gonna do any scratching. So what I do is put a little bit on the edge here, like such, and I'm just gonna do this little area just because it's on camera. And I just like to fill it in, all right? It's gonna be a little bit messy, right? Fill it in, kind of like spackling. You ever spackle a, a room? 
same sort of thing. The goal of what you're trying to do is level off the scratch itself. Remember, the scratch has a, is a big hole. So right now I'm trying to fill it in with all the putty. And, uh, and Bondo dries really fast, so it's not like you have to wait overnight. So you gotta be a little bit quick about it. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just filling it up. Now ideally you wanna, you'd wanna fill it up to the top. So here's the scratch again. You wanna fill it up to the top and ideally you'd leave a little bit of a space so that you can put um, a good crown of, of uh, touch up paint on there. So take this, clean off your edge. Get there, and luckily, you know, with this, you're not scratching anything because it's it's already drying fast. So it's a it's a constant game you're playing here of taking excess off, but not taking too much off, where you're not uh, you know you're not filling in the hole itself. So I'll have a good 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending on how smooth this goes, uh, of filling this filling this little hole in. And this is kind of where the, you know, the craft or the artistry comes in because you're, you're really just filling it in. Now normally you would just put uh, touch-up paint, put touch-up paint, but then as, it, as you fill it in and you put the crown, it starts to sink and then goes below and then that's when you see the bump. And if you go to sand it, it doesn't really matter because there's still a hole there and if you're sanding on top of it, there's still a, a, a hole. So that's why you always want to put a bit of a bubble, but that takes a lot of drying and back and forth and back and forth drying, put it on, drying, put it on. So if it takes overnight just to let that dry, that's kind of the, the catch here is that if you do it wrong, you gotta wait another night. So that's what, you can spend weeks and weeks and weeks doing this. So Bondo kind of shortens that by filling in that gap. And then on top of it, you can just put a nice layer of protection, i.e. paint. So I'm gonna keep doing this and uh, I'll film a little bit and uh, I'll show you what the next step is because it's you don't wanna leave it all gunked up like this. Now, after you've taken a few minutes and filled in that hole or the scratch, uh, again, this is the certain technique that you would use with Bondo. Sometimes people just wanna put touch-up paint and that's cool too. We're just talking about the Bondo step. What you're gonna do is take a little bit of leveler, uh, basically something that's gonna pull off all the remaining stuff. Now, this is where it sort of gets a little bit tricky where you kinda of have to have a good eye and a good hand. You wanna take off the bad stuff, meaning the things that are on the regular paint, the paint that's not scratched, but you don't wanna take off uh, too much. You don't want to take out anything that's in the actual hole or the scratch. So if you do too much, you got to go back and put it back in. So it's a, you kind of have to have a little bit of a uh, technique and a little bit of hand uh, coordination here to get it. So you see how right now it's only right up to that scratch. So now I got to work from the, from the top down. And sometimes that can be a little more challenging because you can't see. But, so I'm going to do this. Uh, this will probably take another 10, 15 minutes to get it perfect. And that's all you should really see is one red line, which is kind of cool. The thing here that I wanted to show that as I was doing this, I said I got to get it on camera, is I did not tape it off like I did the last one. I mean like tape right to the edge the whole way. And the reason why, like I said before, is I was really close to this rubber. And what that means is when I come in here with the, when I come in here with the three inch, uh, uh, roops, I'm not going to be able to get close. It, I, I can only get so close and I won't be able to spin. And remember in all of our videos, if the pad isn't spinning, you're not actually cutting. So if I'm hitting this rubber and just shaking, I'm not going to be able to do anything. That's why I taped it off. So when I was using my, my squeegee going back, you'll see there's little scratches here. But for someone who's taking on a job like this, these little scratches mean nothing, meaning it'll take me five seconds to get those out. That's, that's not a big deal. But I just wanted to make the point that if I did tape all this off, it is a little sometimes weird to work over the tape, but I wouldn't have these little residual scratches. So plus minus, uh, it's really up to you guys. Again, all my videos are not, hey, do it this way, do it that way. I just want to show people this is one way that it's, that it's done. And then, you know, not every car is a G550 wagon with a huge scratch. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a, you know, a different kind of car with harder paint, softer paint, different color but uh, just to get your mind thinking a little bit. So let me spend a few minutes on this and I'll turn the camera back on and show you hopefully just one red line that we're gonna let dry and then I'll go on to the next one. And the next step after that is to touch it up. When you're done removing the excess Bondo, it should look like one 
line in the shape or the form of the scratch. So what happened is, when you have the scratch, we filled it up. Did we fill it up all the way? Probably not. You want to you know, try to stay away from putting a crown on it with the Bondo. And the reason why is you want to be able to fill up just a little bit, maybe 70 or, or uh, maybe the other 30%, meaning 70% is the Bondo, and the other 30% would be the paint, something like that. Uh, where it actually builds a crown so that we can polish this whole area out because of the little fine scratches that we put in when we were manipulating the Bondo to get into the crack. So this is what it should look like after the uh, leveler stage. All right, the next thing you want to do is prepare your paint to go on top of the Bondo. And what I have here is I'm actually using applied colors, uh, my friends out there in, on the west coast. And then what I do is you can take the color let me give these little pipettes. Basically, what you want to do is get about 80% of the paint all right, to about 20% of the shine. And I'll show you what the inside of that looks like in a second. And then I take shine, which comes in a little kit. You do about 20% of that, right? Perfect. So I put that to the side. Then I take my paintbrush, mix it in there, give it a second, and you should be good to go to put on there. Or if you uh, go to your Mercedes dealerships or Audi or Ford or whatever car is that you have, this was 16 bucks, and it's a touch-up, and it comes with a little paintbrush. Now I probably won't use the paintbrush depending on how big it is, but there are some big scratches here where. It's frightening that I could actually use this, which is a little bit of a detailer's joke, meaning, man, if it's that big, that's a serious scratch. But what I do is I can hold it in my hand like this. I think I showed you this on, the, uh, on that other video. And then I take my tiny little, that's a little paintbrush, look how tiny that is, right? Go like that, and then I'll go in there and paint that, but I'll show you how to do that right now. I just wanted to show you that there was a bit of a prep process uh, with regards to getting the paint ready. So, paint looks ready. Time to touch it up. Well, if you thought the first part was tedious, this is where it really starts to get crazy. Take your little paintbrush. I'm just doing this area uh, just because it's on camera. You're gonna lightly fill in this gap here. Now, it takes a lot of patience, and it's okay if it's not a Picasso right off the bat, because the goal is to put a little crown on it. Now, I've said this in the last video, you don't really want to paint. You want to kind of push and get it to fill in. See how it's starting to fill in there? Because the more you start to paint, the more lines are created and I don't know, it doesn't look all that good, but um, Richard is a good guy to ask about a lot of these things, these little nuances. But anyways, you're gonna go in here and fill this up the best you can and then uh, let it dry and we're gonna sand it down. But you'll see. You'll see, it takes time, but it's fun. All right, I've been working on this for a few hours and I got the middle panel and the back paddle done and I have to still do the front. Now, I wanted to, you can see from here, you know, it looks pretty good, but again, that's four or five feet away, so we call that a six footer, meaning it looks good from six foot and I'm sure uh, hopefully you can still see some scratches over there. So yeah, it looks pretty good. But I'm going to get up, grab the camera real time, and show you what's going on, going on here. And there's a few nuances. Luckily, I got to chat with uh, Richard Lynn again, and he's sort of giving me a good perspective on what it should look like uh, in this particular stage. Now, before, I filmed it, and it was a little rocky, meaning it looked a little mountainous. So a little, some parts are for, were uh, deeper than others, and there was the mounds. And I knew if I wet sanded and went right over it, the, the middle part, is not going to be wet sanded. I'm just going to heavily take down the sides, which would probably expose a little bit of the Bondo. Now, the big trick to this, or um, the pain in the butt part, is if you level this or sand it, or basically remove all the gunk that's in there, the extra paint and not the part that's not in the actual scratch, that is what could cause it to go day after day after day, because tonight I have to let this dry. But if I come in here and make a mistake, bang, and, I, and too much Bondo comes out, in theory, you have to wait another day. So this is where it starts to get tricky and more tedious. So I've spent a few hours on this because I wanted to fill it in, but let me grab the camera and show you what I've done. I've really built up this edge and it, it's important because even I was struggling with, hey, what's, how much is enough? So it's a, it's a lot of going back and forth and looking at it. So let me grab it real quick. All right. 
Let me sit down. Now before we took that picture and it was a little rocky. Now as you can see, you see it's a little more bulbous if you will. This spot right here, I gotta put a mark there. I gotta go back and do that. See it's a little in between. See how it's, it goes down a little bit in between there? But something like this, see how it's, see how it's up? Where's the camera? There you go, see how it's a little bit higher? It, so it, it's a mountain instead of a valley. See, a little bit mountainous. So what I'm gonna do is, originally I was gonna sand it. Where's that low spot? See that low spot right there? See, this is, this is the key to understanding everything. This low spot right there, right where my shadow is right now, see it right there, so right here, I have to put a little bit more touch up on there to build it up to look more like that. See what's a little bit pushed up in the middle? That's good because you're going to sand that down. Now when I spoke to Richard, so I'll keep going and chatting about it, when I spoke to Richard, uh, he mentioned that we should use the leveler that came with Ally, and I haven't, I've never used that before so I'm excited to try that. And you have to have a nice little touch. You have to kind of move with it. Well, we'll talk about that tomorrow in the morning and see how good it comes out. But in the past, I've always just wet sanded this with 2,000 or 3,000 grit really easily, really softly, just to get the extra, like this excess and then the top excess, but not in the middle. And then I'll just show you for perspective, that's what the scratch looked like before. You know, you know the rest of the car that I have to do. So. Anyways, that's the stage we're at right now. This is going to dry overnight. I have to do this other part um, off camera. And uh, I'll come back in the morning and show you the leveler. Or if I, in the middle of the night, wake up with another genius <laughs> idea or something to, uh, to do it with 2000, then maybe I'll do it that way. But we'll find out tomorrow, and then I'll show you the after shot. All right, we're back on day two. Now, last night I finished at about 8.30 at night, and I wanted to give it 10, 12. It'd be great if it was 15 hours. Um, but now it's about 8.30 in the morning. It is a bit damp. Uh, there's fog rolling in. It was beautiful for But uh, the humidity um, is something I have to keep in mind. It's something that you need to think about too, where you are in the country or in the world. That's a, a, a factor. So I would have loved to have the heat lamps on here uh, to help uh, cure this a little bit faster. But we're working on it now. Now what I did uh, off camera just a few minutes ago is I wanted to test out the leveler. So we have two different approaches. You can do the leveler approach, meaning with the, uh, the liquid that actually comes from uh, applied colors. So I tried that, it actually works pretty good, but you really need to have a steady hand because if you wipe too much, and I'll pull the camera in and show you, the, you'll expose the Bondo again. Now if you remember yesterday, uh, I, I put some tape all along here, along the lines, uh, per Richard Lynn's advice. And, I, and then I, I did that and I said, hmm, maybe I'll try it this way. This whole experience, uh, remember, normally we're taking out these tiny little rock chips or these little things this long. This is, a, this is an experiment. I, I knew it was going to be um, not perfect, but it's going to be much better. I didn't know what the level of much better was going to be. So Richard Lynn's advice was to put the piece of tape and now looking back, I probably should have taped the whole thing off. It would have made it a little bit cleaner, more tedious, but probably cleaner. So the other option is I can sand it and over here I sand it a little bit down and I basically took off a little bit of the, the ridges or the, um, you know, the, the, the touch up marks. So I'm playing back and forth and I want to show you the two different options. Again, there is no right or wrong answer. It depends on the, the humidity outside, the color, the make. Um, the, how hard the paint is, how long you let it cure. There's multiple factors. Again, this isn't the perfect way to do it. A more, I wanted to capture this on camera to, to show everybody, hey, these are different options. These are the things you need to think about, but it's almost impossible for me to show you this is the correct way to put the, I can't, I, there's no way to do that. So uh, I thought it'd be a fun experiment to kind of walk you through and kind of put you in my brain as to how I'm thinking and approaching these things. So let's take the leveler approach first and I'll show you uh, what it looks like on this side. Now the first approach is to use the leveler. You're gonna put it on here, and the big thing is you have a nice clean cloth. Uh, you don't wanna to put too much on there, and you're literally just going to lightly dab and kind of pick off the areas that are not in the scratch. And you'll see the paint will start to come off. But the downside is you have to be really careful because once you take it off, it's off. See, I just, I think I may have gone a little thin there. And what's going to happen is 
you're going to uh, pull some of the black paint off. But how do you know how much to push? Well, I guess that comes with experience in figuring it out. And I'm not trying to pretend that I know how much to push because it's, it's kind of different every time. So you'll see, you see some of the black paint coming off. It's a, it's a game going back and forth to figure out how much you're taking off. Uh, it's, it's another way of, let's say, sanding it down, which will be option number two. So you put a little bit on there. Once you first put a little tip here, once you first put it on, it's going to be uh, a little bit more aggressive in the beginning. And that obviously makes sense because it's fresh at that point. And you want to keep rotating, you want to keep rotating uh, the towel. So, because once it gets full, it's not going to pick up anymore because it's, because it's already full. The black stuff's there. So you're going to move a little bit here. You don't want to go too crazy. You don't want to put too much on there. And you're just going to have, it's just, you're sort of massaging the paint here and kind of just barely, I sometimes equate it in, in, you know, seminars and things of, it's like archaeology. You're just, you don't want to damage the bone, you know, the, the, the thing that you're trying to get. You're just trying to, you know, move away a little bit of the dirt or whatever. So that's that sort of mentality. This is, this is the leveler step and this is what uh, Applied Colors recommends. And I can see it being very successful uh, two separate ways. And, th and this is me going through this thought process as I would have loved to have left the tape on there. So if you have a rock chip or a tiny little scratch, leave tape on there. I mean, right on the edge. Uh, fill it up with the uh, colors that are supplied or your touch up paint. Let it sit there, let it cure overnight, then come back, pull the tape off and then lightly do this and just clean up the little areas around there. It, it should work pretty, uh, pretty well for you. This, uh, I mean, if we wanted it perfect, clearly we would just repaint it, but we're getting it. It just takes time. All right, option two is to actually sand the area with 2,000, 2,500, 3,000, somewhere in that area. Again, you have to you know, use your judgment. You remember in one of the drive clean videos, we actually used a pencil top and we came in there and we used the pencil, but that was for a rock chip. Remember, tiny little area, that was the surface of this, you know, tiny. This, again, is huge, so not gonna be really a, a good option for us. So right now, I'm just starting off with 3,000 grit, which is almost next to nothing. Um, very easy to get out and I'm using a bit of spray wax. I just want to test so we're gonna put it in here I've had Put it on the edge. I got a sanding block in there very soft, right? I'm just gonna kind of level this down just a little bit and You just kind of have to play and figure out How far you can go is it working? Do you need to go with a stronger or heavier grit? Should I go 2500 should I go 2000? It all depends on how long the cure time was. So, and I'm going a little bit against the grain to see if I can, um, you know, whittle down those little mountainous edges. Now, one of the reasons why I didn't sand over here is I just didn't have any room to get the sandpaper in. And if I did, I wouldn't have enough room to get the Rube's polisher in here afterwards. So, uh, it was kind of fun experiment to play with both sides. And sometimes you have to use two different options, but um, I cannot reiterate, I'm just showing you multiple options and things you can do. But I will agree that on a small chip and not a gargantuan one like this, uh, the actual technique or method that the applied color guys say to do um, probably is uh, the best approach and that is fill it up with the supplied material, let it dry, and then use the leveler to take it off. So this is sort of whittled down. Let me pull the camera in and I'll show you. I mean, there's scratch marks because obviously we're sanding, but you'll see that the, the top ridges have been whittled down and now it's just a matter of how far do I go without taking out the paint. That, that's kind of this, this game here that uh, makes it very technical. And when you make a mistake, you have to go back and, and restart it again. So that's, that's sort of the consequence of doing it. Let me pull the camera in. Before compounding with the Rupees 3-inch pneumatic polisher, I wanted to try blending the surrounding area with a 5,000 grit disc and interface on the Grows Garage 3-inch because a lot of power wasn't needed in this particular case. After much sanding, you can see the touch-up has begun to level off with the surrounding paint, thereby making it less obvious. Next, I use the Rupees 3-inch polisher along with the 3-inch Meguiar's cutting disc which makes quick work of the 5,000 grit. Notice, however, we are still slightly removing black touch-up on the pad, so be careful not to overdo it. 
Lastly, polish the panel for a perfect blend. All right, guys, after a few more hours today, I'm pretty much finished. Now, I think the car turned in uh, into what we call a six footer to about, I don't know, a two footer or a three footer. So it's still there. If you get your face up close, you can still see it, but way, way better. And I think it's within the range of acceptability in terms of, you know, talking to the customer or the client, the person who owns it and measuring the level of, hey, it's not gonna be perfect, it's gonna be really, really great, but not, not perfect. You want it perfect, you have to get it repainted. So I think with that understanding, this looks pretty good. More importantly, it's protected, it's not gonna rust. Now, of the options that we did, we did option one, which was using Bondo because there was lots of different levels, meaning deep gouges here, then a little bit of a gouge, and a deep gouge, so there's a lot of depth uh, difference. And when it's really deep, sometimes you wanna use Bondo. So I did that in some cases. Uh, and then we just did, uh, we also did the wet sanding uh, technique versus just using the leveler. And then the other, the third technique was just to goop it in the hole with uh, the supplied material from, from Allied and then uh, remove it with leveler. So it was kind of three different choices. So what's the bottom line? After doing all of the, these testing and, and sanding and doing different things, I think I would have approached it uh, as I, I found out from Allied, which is basically filling it in as close as you can, uh, you know, filling up the, the crack, having a little bit of a crown, and then wiping it level with the leveler, as you saw, back and forth. And it takes a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of skill to kind of go back and forth without removing too much. But I think that might be uh, the easiest, easiest way out of the three panels. Either way, they all worked, but in terms of uh, how much time it took and the level of skill and things of that nature. Um, but anyways, hopefully you learned something. So did I. I, I learned a whole lot. You know, that's the whole point of doing things like this is you kind of jump in there, you figure it out, each car is different and you just put it back in the Rolodex of your detailing skills. Hopefully this gave you a little insight as I've said before and I'll say it many times, this isn't the only way to do it. This is just the way that I've chosen to do it today. If you have a better way of doing it, shoot me an email at larry at ammonyc.com. I wanna give a big thanks to Richard Lynn. You can check him out at showcardetailing.com. And as always, appreciate you watching. Have a great day.